This is Find Your Dream Job, the podcast that helps you get hired, have the career you want, and make a difference in life. I'm Mac Pritchard. I'm also the founder of Max List. It's a job board in the Pacific Northwest that helps people find fulfilling careers. Every week, I interview a career expert about the tools you need to find the work you want. Today, I'm talking with Kirsten Wyatt. She's going to share an insider's perspective on how hiring in government works. Kirsten is the co-founder and executive director of ELGL, the Engaging Local Government Leaders Network. It's a nonprofit that engages the brightest minds in local government. She joins us today in the MaxList studio. Kirsten, let's get started. What do you need to do differently when you look for a government job? You need to be prepared for every experience to be very different. And by that, I mean agencies vary. Um, there is so much variation in what you will find from city government to county government to town government because processes are not standardized. And that means that you might apply for one job and they require a paper printed application. And you might apply for another job and they have a completely online um, candidate management system. And so when you're applying for these jobs, you're going to approach each of those very differently. Um, and it may seem a little backwards in this day and age to be printing out a application and having to mail it in, but that's the case in some agencies. And then in others, you might be pleasantly surprised with how streamlined um, and high tech it is to apply for a job. And so expecting that wide variation across government agencies is something to immediately prepare yourself for. Every system might have its own approach. Uh, what about finding government jobs? Is it just as you need to be prepared to uh, submit your application, perhaps using different techniques? How can people find these positions? I, how are they shared? So it is pretty fragmented. And I think honing in on your geographic area or your search area is important because often some of the very best local government job resources are found at the state level. So for example, a state league of cities or counties association might have a great job board for cities or counties in that state. Um, on the flip side, you might also find um, some use out of some of these um, um, aggregator websites. Um, for example, um, NeoGov, which is an online um, resume management system, an applicant tracking system. Um, they they run a site called Government Jobs, and so they compile all of their clients' jobs into that one site. But really, there isn't one perfect location to look for that perfect government job. You really have to put your feelers out and bookmark a lot of sites. Um, I know that when some of our members have been looking for jobs, they will pick the three states that they're most interested in working in, for example, and bookmark the State Association of Cities, of Counties, um, maybe even of Special Districts is another great um, resource source for local government, and then check back on those sites frequently, in addition to some of the aggregator sites that are out there. Okay, you mentioned aggregator sites uh, and associations. Don't public managers have to post every job, Kirsten? Uh, I, uh, it, it, can they actually fill these jobs through word of mouth? And if they are required to post every position, wouldn't they do that on their website as well? Absolutely. So um, local government websites are going to have a very specific job feature. I know that when I've worked for cities, often the jobs or the HR section of the website was one of the um, most popular sections of the city site. So you can go to each individual local government, especially if you're really focused on working for one particular agency. Um, often what you might find, um, like you said, governments will be expected to post every job. But if you notice that a job has a very short application window, for example, or that they've posted a job and they only are looking for um, internal candidates, um, that might be an indication that that job might be more of a reach because there perhaps is somebody internally um, who is a candidate for that job. And so be prepared for that. It's It could be discouraging when you see the perfect job title and the perfect job description, but it is posted out of procedure because it is only available for internal candidates only. So many jobs get filled by word of mouth in the private sector and the nonprofit world. In other words, they're never posted. Uh, there's there's no announcement on a website, no advertisement uh, on a job board or even in an old fashioned newspaper. Does that happen in government? Do our jobs, public jobs, part of the hidden job market? Are they never posted? 
I don't think it's that they're never posted, but there definitely is the value and the benefit um, that you talk about on this podcast of that word of mouth job market and of building out your network because of that word of mouth effect. Because getting your name out there and getting to know people that work in the local government realm um, helps you be well informed when a job is coming open or will be open. You know, and and sometimes we joke it's kind of like when there's a coaching change in like the NFL or in college football where one coach leaves and then all of a sudden there's a big shuffle and it ripples across multiple teams. The same thing happens in government. We will see a manager leave and all of a sudden you start to think, okay, well, which assistant is going to take that job? And then that assistant job opens. And so having a network that gives you that inside scoop is helpful. Yes, you'll have to go to that website and go through the application. However, you will know to go to that website to start that application. Well, let's talk about networking. Sometimes uh, people tell me they have an experience where they reach out, particularly when a position is open to a hiring manager, and they say, I'd like to meet with you. And the manager will say, I can't. There's a set of rules I need to follow. And of course, every culture and uh, sector has its rules, but in government, these processes in order to be as fair as possible to all applicants are often uh, stricter. Uh, what? How do you see people network effectively with hiring managers, both when a job is open and uh, before a position becomes available? You're absolutely right. And that comes down to the equity factor, this idea that if the hiring manager is meeting with one candidate, they could potentially be getting um, some unfair information. And so often they'll just choose to not meet with anybody. And that's why building that Um, your base network before that job even opens is so important. So when that hiring manager sees your name, they're not, they're not having to have that pre interview meeting with you because they already know you. They've met you at a conference or through your writing or through your information sharing. Um, And that's why that network before you even apply is so critical. If a position is open and a hiring manager can't see you because the rules don't allow it, Do you see candidates reach out to other people and sign that agency successfully and have conversations that can be helpful? Absolutely. And I feel like I spend a lot of time helping connect our members with other people in that agency to learn more about the culture. A great example, um, we had a member who was interested in working for a city government, and I knew that he couldn't realistically reach out to the hiring the boss. Um, But there were at least five other members in our organization who had worked in that agency. And those were great connections for him. And so, you know, helping make those connections and, and learning who had worked there previously, and letting them get those perspectives, that's incredibly valuable. And I think too, you know, government hasn't started yet consistently using sites like Glassdoor. And so we really are relying on word of mouth and of network um, to learn more about jobs. You mentioned going to conferences, building relationships with managers before positions open up. What are your other networking tips, uh, Kirsten, for people who want to work in government or perhaps are already in the sector and want to move up? So a term that I use almost too much, I think that some of our members, you know, want me to stop saying it so often, is this concept of networking for ideas. That when we are trying to find new opportunities, it can't be all about me, me, me. It has to be about the knowledge that you're putting out into the world and that you're attracting others to you through that knowledge share. And one of the ways that we do that is through um, having people write for our organization about their experiences, about things they're passionate about. Um, so they are taking their knowledge and they're sharing it with other people. And what that does is it gro- grows everyone's knowledge and worldview about those local government topics. And to me, that's most important because when you are only reaching out to people because you're looking for your next step up, there is an authenticity issue, I think, that comes into play. But when someone is familiar with you because you have freely shared your expertise and knowledge. Um, There really is a trust and there is a um, confidence in that um, asking you to come in for that next stage of the interview process in extending that job offer to you because you have networked authentically and to create a real relationship. And so that is really what I stress 
you know, this networking for ideas concept. And that is what gets you ahead, I think, in government, because it really is a network that's built on freely sharing information. You know, government is the original open source network. Um, nothing we do is proprietary. We can share everything we know. So if you're doing that when you're networking, you're showing that you're already going to be a great employee when you're hired. What about lack of government experience, especially for people who are mid-career? Is that a deal killer? when you apply for a job with government and and you've never worked in government before? So progressive governments, or what I would term progressive governments, are starting to get rid of some of the minimums, um, experience minimums, with the understanding that experience and um, performance can come from all sectors. However, in many, many organizations, there will be a minimum requirement. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't apply. For example, I just heard about a city manager who was hired um, with no city management experience, despite the job application saying that they needed to have 10 years. But I think in that setting, the person was able to convey very accurately that they had the skills in their private sector experience to lead a community. And so I don't think it should be a reason to not apply, but in situations where you have a chance to explain yourself in your cover letter, in your supplemental questions, you need to use that time really efficiently, even more so than somebody who has those years of experience. The other thing that I stress is there are so many ways to get some government adjacent experience. So for example, volunteer for your planning commission, serve on the budget committee, you know, volunteer with your local library. Those are experiences that you can bring to bear in an interview and say, you know, I have not worked for government, but I have worked closely with government in this very important capacity. And that just shows, again, that commitment and that willing to, willingness to knowledge share. I want to take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about applications, because as you mentioned at the start of our conversation, every government might have its own approach. And for many people, these applications are a puzzle. They, they, they feel there might be a secret code in how they should fill them out. So we'll be back, and when we return, we'll continue our conversation with Kirsten Wyatt. Would you walk into a job interview without Googling the employer? Of course not. You'll want to show that you're familiar with the company, its leaders, and its challenges. So you spend 15 or 30 minutes online before the interview. You look at the website. You read the LinkedIn profiles of the people on the interview panel and you skim a newspaper profile of the company's CEO. Employers do the same thing with you. Are you happy with what they'll see? If not, I've got a free online course that can help. It's called How to Wow and Woo Employers Online. Go to maxlist.org slash wow. In three short video classes, you'll learn how to shine on the internet. You'll get practical tips for how to handle unflattering photos, embarrassing social posts, and other dodgy material that can harm a job application. You'll see how to use LinkedIn and other social accounts to impress, not scare away employers. And you'll get our best ideas for growing and engaging your professional network online. Sign up today. It's free. Go to maxlist.org slash wow. Learn how to make your social media accounts an asset not a liability when you look for work. Go to maxlist.org slash wow. Now, let's get back to the show. We're back in the Maxlist studio. I'm talking with Kirsten Wyatt. She's the executive director of Engaging Local Government Leaders. The acronym is ELGL. Before the break, we were talking about applications, and at the start of our conversation, you had said every government might have its own approach to collecting uh, online applications. There's there's an art to filling these out when you apply for a government job, isn't there, Kirsten? Absolutely. And I think if if you're applying for a job that's using an online applicant tracking system, so if you're filling out an online application, it is even more important for you to pay attention to the keywords and the key skills um, and knowledge and abilities that you need to have and include those keywords in your application because they governments are using some of those keyword searches 
to line up whether or not your application and your skills match up with what they're looking for. And it doesn't mean that if you don't have those skills and abilities that you should lie about it, but it does mean that you should be even more careful about making sure that you are aligning your work with what the government is looking for. And again, it goes back to making sure that you're not just using a standard resume and cover letter across every single job you apply for. So again, that customization and that um, formatting to make sure that you are showing why you are the, the best fit for that job. Well, private employers use applicant tracking systems and they pay attention to keywords. Is there something different that government does that people should be aware of before they hit that send button? I think for some positions, you are going to want to pay attention to minimums when it comes to years of experience, type of experience, education, because that could be, especially for larger agencies that are getting you know, thousands of applications, that could be a, a minimum that they just use to cut off um, you know, whether or not you can advance in the pool. Um, in very, very large agencies, they're going to use some type of testing. And so um, getting used to that and becoming familiar with the fact that you might have to take some type of test to advance to the next stage. Um, but ultimately, I think just showing how your experience is practical to that job, because the important thing to remember is that government government can't take the same types of risks when it comes to hiring that maybe a private sector could. You know, everything that government does is up for public scrutiny. And if you are making a big hiring decision um, and going through that lengthy process, which can be time consuming and expensive, they want to know that they're hiring someone that they can um, defend and justify, whether it's to a governing body, to the public at large. And so just making sure that you aren't just, again, taking a standard resume and using that to apply. I'm glad you brought up the question of risk. It's a factor that all employers consider, but it is, I think, more important in the public sector. What are your tips for how someone can present themselves in a way that shows they are, if not the risk-free candidate, the the person who's going to, um, uh, who has the, the least amount of risk? I think tying the resume, your skills and abilities and experiences back to the job at hand is key because I think that that is what makes, it, it's almost like at that creating a one-to-one -one ratio between um, what the government's looking for and what you can bring. Um, it's unfortunate, but there sometimes isn't that growth period or um, factor that you can put into a job saying, oh, you can learn on the job and you can, um, you know, you can learn as you go. And, you know, it's especially relevant when we think about jobs that have certifications. I mean, local government is responsible for public safety. You don't want your, your water supervisor to be learning on the job. And so, you know, making sure that you have some of those credentials and you can align those um, well is going to be really important. For management style jobs, I think, you know, showing an knowledge and an expertise of of what it means to work in a modern day workplace is really important. You know, what it means to um, be very transparent, very communicative, um, to be engaging. Those are topics that local government leadership is looking for to make sure that they're hiring people who can come in and adapt and recognize how the changing face of government um, out to the public um, needs to be, needs to have somebody that has those skills. You mentioned supplementary materials. I think this might be unique to uh, government, if you fill out an application, often you might be asked to provide answers to a set of essay questions, for example. Do those supplementary materials matter? And uh, how can people make the most of that opportunity? So I have heard from so many HR directors that a lot of people skip those questions. And I think sometimes they think that they might be optional or that they might be, you know, just kind of there on a whim. But supplemental questions in many cases are helping um, decide between candidates that on paper look very similar. And so the amount of time and thoughtfulness you put into those answers really matters. And it really is your first chance to show that you've done your homework, that you've learned about the community, that you know what issues they're facing. You can often even look at the questions and discern, okay, well, what are some of their priorities? If they're asking you questions about, for example, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, it's it's worth your time to go online and to find out what is their plan, what has prompted this question. And so it really is your first chance to make a great impression. And for people who might feel constrained by 
the lack of space, say, in an application form, it's also an opportunity to address some of those points you were making earlier, both about your transferable skills and experiences and the perspective that you bring to the position, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think it's also a chance if you're making some sort of geographic move to explain that, to say, you know, if you were explaining why you're moving to Oregon and you're looking for a local government job from Texas, it's a chance for you to explain, you know, Oregon land use law is very different than what I've experienced in Texas. And, you know, this is a way that I have researched that. And here's how I'm answering that question based on that research. It really is a way to showcase that you've done that extra um, lift that someone might need to know if they're thinking, why might they apply for a job when they live so far away? You mentioned cover letters as well. Those matter in these application packets, don't they? They absolutely do. And again, it is a chance to showcase that you've learned about the community that you're interviewing in. So many times we've heard from our members that they have interviewed people who know nothing about the organization that they're applying with. They've just seen a job and they've put their application in. Often it's really easy to apply for jobs, especially when you're using an online system. And so using the cover letter to showcase why this particular city or county or district is most appealing to you over another one is a great thing to do in your cover letter. And it's also just a way to show that you've put in a little bit of extra time and effort to understand what that community is looking for. I want to get to interviews, particularly interview panels, but two quick questions about applications before we do that. What's the most common mistake you see people make on government applications? I think it's not tailoring your experience to what the job is looking for. And so if we were to just use a very basic example, let's say you have background in business or finance and you're applying for a government budget or finance job, um, just putting down the work that you've done in accounts payable, accounts receivable is not going to fly when you have to apply that to a government position. You're going to want to go and look at what they're looking for and making sure that some of the experiences that you've had, albeit in the private sector, um, have some of the same language and terminology that they're looking for in the public sector. So you have to show, you can't assume that the reader will interpret this for you. Well, and let's be frank. At times, there have been people who think, oh, I've worked in the private sector, so public sector is going to be easy. Um, people that maybe have looked down on public sector work because they've worked for a you know, Fortune 500 company, and of course, they're going to want my expertise, and they're going to want my experience. But People who work for government want to see that that you want to be there and that they're not your second choice or they're not, you know, some fallback option. And so don't just fall back on an idea that maybe you've had some great experience in a different sector. Really take each job as it appears and, you know, put your heart into it, put your all into it. And don't just assume that um, a different sector's experience might benefit you if you're making that jump. Okay, quickly, what's your number one tip for filling out a government job application? Pay attention to keywords and make sure that those keywords appear in your experience. So if you have a job that's listed, make sure that the bullet points um, or the supplemental information about that job includes the keywords that you found in the job application or in the job posting. Let's move on to interview panels because that's a common technique when governments hire people, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It is not uncommon, especially for higher level management positions, for you to interview with up to three panels comprised of four to five people. And so you are expected to go to each panel and to answer their questions. They might be a little bit different in scope or in style. Um, and then maybe even end the day with the hiring manager, um, you know, talking with them specifically about your potential fit in that role. Um, so getting used to this idea of you sitting on one side of the table and five people sitting on the other um, is something to expect, especially if you're looking at that management level. And quickly, these panels, they're very structured, Often, uh, there's a set of questions. Every candidate is asked the same set of questions. Often, there isn't a follow-up. So it's not, there isn't an easy give and take. That is absolutely right. And again, the what you'll experience is you're on one side of the table and person one asks question one and person two asks question two. And you're responding to those. 
Sometimes there's a little bit more flexibility. I think government is trying to get better at making them be more conversational. But often what's happening is that there's a sheet for each um, interviewee, and people are filling that out as they come in the room. And government doesn't want to not ask a question to one applicant and then ask it to another and then face the situation where, oh, you know, we didn't get this information from this person, and so maybe they don't rise to the top. And so there really is this need to cover all of that ground. And And so, again, it can seem exceptionally sterile, especially when maybe we even know people in the room and you think, why are they going and they're being so, um, you know, precise about asking these questions? How do you navigate that, Kirsten? Uh, Especially if you know people, can Mm -hmm. you ask questions of your own? Should you try to engage in chit-chat before or after? What, What are your tips? I think that recognizing that that's the scenario as you walk into the room And then trying to follow up on things that maybe you said in response in question one when you're answering question four, I think that's always appropriate as well, you know, making it as natural as you can. Um, I think that not being surprised when someone asks you a question and you've already answered it in some format, it's always important to not just say, well, but I already answered that for you because maybe that person wasn't listening. And so using that time to just say, and to reiterate, I have experience in this, that, and however you choose to answer that question. Um, Use every question, even if it is a repeat, because again, they're not doing it because they're not listening. They're doing it because they feel like they have to. But not only do they have to, they're doing it in the interest of fairness to all the candidates. It is a process that they are following. They're not making it up on the spot. Absolutely. Uh, What is the best way to follow up on an interview like that? So I have experienced everything from the the moment after the interview concludes, the person is in their car writing thank you notes, and then they drop them off at the front desk, and they're distributed to the 15 people that served on the panel. I've also experienced that the um, applicant sends an email to say thank you to the HR director or hiring manager, um, and so then that's shared with the with the um, pool. I don't think it's a horrible thing to follow up with the folks that you connected with or that you um, you even knew beforehand, and just saying thanks for the opportunity. Um, so it really varies, but. As in all interview situations, I think a follow-up just saying thank you for this opportunity is just the gracious and kind thing to do. Tell us what's next for you, Kirsten. So I'm really excited because we are hosting our first hyper-local conferencing series this fall. We're going to be in 25 cities across the country and also in London, England, um, hosting one-hour learning sessions about local government topics. And we're calling it the ELGL Road Trip. And it is scheduled for the week of September 23rd. So we're probably coming to a city near a um, Find Your Dream Job podcast listener. And so you can learn more about that on our website. Um, And then we're also looking forward to bringing our first ever um, annual conference, uh, now that we've become a national organization, back to Portland. And so we'll be here in Portland for ELGL 20 on May 13th through 15th, 2020. You also host a podcast, and I know people can learn more about that show and these events by visiting ELGL.org. Well, Kirsten, given all the useful tips you've shared today, what's the one thing you want uh, people to remember that insiders know about getting a government job? Working in government is incredibly fulfilling, and there is such a wide variety of jobs and opportunities that are out there. And just because you've never worked in government before, it should never limit your aspiration or dream of working in public service. And so don't let some of the old-fashioned rules, whether it's paper applications, whether it's awkward interviews, um, hold you back from pursuing a career in public service because it's incredibly rewarding. Um, And so don't let um, an old-fashioned applicant experience hold you back from finding that amazing career that allows you to serve others. Great. Thanks for being on the show, Kirsten. One of the most important points I think Kirsten made was about the importance of networking when you're looking for a government job. You might think because every position will be posted publicly and every application will be scored by a system that typically assign some kind of numerical score, that it's all about numbers and process. But people still matter too. 
I think Kirsten did a good job of explaining not only the importance of connecting with people inside a government agency where you want to work, but she gave us great advice about how to do it, not only in person, but online. If you're looking for tips about how to do your networking better online, we've got a three-part video course that can help. It's called How to Wow and Woo Employers Online. You can get it today. It's free. Just go to maxlist.org slash wow. Again, that's maxlist.org slash wow. Well, I hope you'll join us for next week. Our topic is a provocative one. Have you ever left a job interview feeling that you bombed? But maybe the problem was the employer, not you. Our guest, Farrell Bolding, will explain why this might be so and what you can do about it. Until next time, thanks for letting us help you find your dream job.